Welcome to episode 71 of the Headspace and Timing podcast, a show brought to you by the Change Your POV podcast network. Today, I have a conversation with Stephanie Keegan, a mother of combat veteran Daniel Keegan. Stephanie talks about her efforts to keep Daniel's story alive, not for her sake or his, but so that others don't have to go through what they went through. In today's divisive and politically charged environment, Stephanie's advocacy regarding veteran mental health and substance abuse are making an impact for the long term. Here's a short preview of what you'll hear in today's episode, then you'll hear a quick word from one of the Change Your POV Podcast Network sponsors, then we'll jump into the show. I have to say, I have been equally received on both sides of the aisle, so this is a very easy, nonpartisan conversation, easy in that it it's something that people do listen to, and it doesn't matter, you know, who they're representing, they do listen, and I I am enormously grateful. I've gotten as much support on both sides of the aisle as I could hope for, and I'm going to continue badgering people till I get even more. Today's sponsor is Shopify. Whether you sell online, on social media, in-store, or out of the trunk of your car, Shopify has you covered. No design skills needed. Establish your brand online with a custom domain name and online store with instant access to hundreds of the best looking themes and complete control over the look and feel, you finally have a gorgeous store of your own that reflects the personality of your business. We use Shopify here at Change Your POV Podcast Network and we highly recommend it. Get straight to growing your business, let them handle the rest. Go to changeyourpov.com forward slash resources to claim your 14 day free trial. Again, go to changeyourpov.com forward slash resources to claim your 14 day free trial. Welcome to the Change Your POV Podcast Network. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes about veteran mental health. My name's Dwayne France, and I'm a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After I retired from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set right, however, it was just a huge useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing isn't set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about federal mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support veterans, service members, and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Headspace and Timing Podcast once again, and as always, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to listen and to learn more about veteran mental health. Uh, we often do have uh, mental health providers, both who are veterans and not veterans on the show, and veterans themselves, uh, but today I have a little bit of a, a different uh, guest. Um, she is not a veteran, but she has served uh, along with us in, in many different ways. I often say uh, that during my deployments, my wife served with me uh, and my mother served with me in different ways, and uh, my guest today, Stephanie Keegan, is definitely someone that served um, uh, through her son's deployment in a very different way. She's the, uh, the mother of a paratrooper with uh, two tours in Afghanistan, and Stephanie's son, Sergeant uh, Daniel Keegan, was honorably discharged but, dis- but died of an opioid overdose um, after, after his service. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to bring on Stephanie to talk a lot about uh, not even her experience, uh, not just her experience um, as a mother of a service member, the Blue Star mother, uh, but then also uh, what she saw her son Daniel going through. So uh, without further ado, Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, as we talked a little bit before you. You've been uh, banging this gong quite a bit um, about 
uh, and not just about Daniel's story, but about veterans' story. Uh, but maybe we could talk about, um, in the beginning, you and, and Daniel and sort of how that began. Okay, so Daniel served for eight years in the 82nd Airborne. He was um, an intelligence analyst for the 7th Special Forces Group, and because I'm his mother and I like to brag, I have to tell you, he was the 2009 7th Special Forces Group Soldier of the Year. Um, And he loved his job. When he was well, he loved his job. He deployed to Kandahar, Afghanistan twice for a total of about 26 months. And when he came home the second time, he came home with a very, very ugly case of PTSD. It was evident the first second I saw his face when he got off that plane. So he struggled for a number of years, stayed in the Army, um, went to school in the Green to Gold program, um, and chose the University of New Hampshire because he had primarily um, grown up in New Hampshire. Uh, His wife was from the area, and they wanted to go home for a little while. While he was in his last semester of school, carrying a 4.2 GPA um, and being the student commander of the ROTC program at the school, he became involved with heroin. He was having a terrible, terrible time when he was idle, getting rid of the ghosts that were traveling with him in his head. And A friend, so to speak, said, I have something that will help, and his wife was out of town on spring break, and by the time she came back, he was a raging heroin addict. So we got him into treatment. Um, He went through the Army Substance Abuse Program and unfortunately was not able to graduate from school because his time allotment for education passed while he was in treatment. He returned to Fort Bragg, worked for a year, and then took a two-week leave under strict orders of his commander, who said he'd been working too many hours. And on the first night of his leave, we got a call at 2 o'clock in the morning saying he was on life support at the Cape Fear Valley Medical Center, and they didn't expect him to survive. He had overdosed on heroin and cocaine. Uh, He went through a discharge process that was challenging at best, and was able to get his um, honorable discharge. He left the Army in September of 2014. He immediately applied for disability through VA. It took them until November of 2015 to give him his disability rating of 90%. They immediately set him up for an appointment for dual diagnosis treatment um, at um, of an inpatient facility for the addiction and the PTSD piece. He was scheduled to go in on January 21st, and he died on January 8th of 2016. And just to clarify, Dan's death was a result of his drug use, but it was an infection that he developed from his IV drug use that he thought was the flu. So he didn't worry too much when he couldn't get to a doctor because the VA couldn't provide him a ride. And unfortunately, he just sat down one day and passed away. He had um, endocarditis and pneumonia and a blood clot in his brain. And and these are are a lot of the challenging stories. Um, There's no... Uh, there's no star for family members like you. You know, I right. see a, a gold star family um, who loses a son or daughter while they're on active duty, uh, or a family member. Um, but this is uh, this is another challenge. Um, obviously, um, like Daniel and and I've often said it before on the show and to others that I've lost more of my soldiers and, and former uh, people that I served with to suicide than I have uh, while I was deployed to combat. Um, and, right. and that's and that's challenging. And, and uh, a friend of mine often says is, uh, although the shot was fired on the battlefield, it took many years um, uh, for it to really take effect. And, and right. there's there's obviously no doubt um, that uh, hearing Daniel's uh, experience and, and it went and it went to it went to a bad place and it went wrong, uh, and ultimately um, that became. Uh, it obviously is a tragic story, but it but it became a r- rallying cry for you. You've taken that, um, not just that you don't want Daniel's memory to be lost, but you you want you want to make some changes. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And for me, you know, I would love to have some kind of designation for families like mine, not a gold star, but maybe, you know, a white star or something. I don't know. But for me, that's hardly as important as the next mother that buries her child or the next brothers that don't get to have their big brother with them on their wedding days or in their various life celebrations. As, as important as all of the, the recognition is, as important as it is to my husband and I who will grieve for the rest of our lives, it is more important that some things get changed so that this stops happening. It's not right to see another family go through what happened to Daniel. And it was his absolute intention when he got well and when he was, you know, out of the inpatient treatment program, he was bound and determined that he was going to make sure that the VA got the help they needed, the support they needed to provide the services that veterans felt really needed to come directly from the VA. So I promised him before he died that if for some reason he couldn't do the work he wanted to do, I would do it. And I remember that phone call like it was yesterday because he was in North Carolina and I was up in New York and we talked every day. And I said, look, I know you're struggling. I will do whatever I can to keep you alive for the next two months until you go into that treatment plan, into that treatment program. But if something happens to you, I want you to rest assured that I will be taking up the torch on this. I will scream to the high heavens. And he laughed and he said, well, of course you will, because the only person I know with a bigger mouth than me is you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, that's, uh, and, and that's very important. So what has that advocacy looked like in the last couple of years um, for you locally and even nationally? Okay, so... When you lose a child, Daniel was 28, almost 29 years old, and, you know, you've got to go through the grief process and you have family. I am a mother through and through, always has been, and, and it was very important to me that I stood up and I moved forward in a productive way. We had taught our children, we have three boys, we taught them that they were very fortunate. They had good brains and good hearts. They always had a roof over their head and food in their bellies. And if they saw something that was wrong, they needed to stand up and fight for the people who couldn't stand up and fight for themselves. So Daniel took it to the Army, which was a little further than I would have liked it to go. But, you know, he was proud to do that. And um, it was important to me that I stood up and made some noise. It took me a while. I wanted to make sure the family was okay that, you know, we were managing. I didn't want to go out before I was ready to be hit with questions that wouldn't break me. Um, so in the fall of 2016, I made a little bit of noise because during a campaign event, the current president said something about how there were strong veterans and then there were weak veterans. And, I, you know, that was, the, that was the key I needed to open the door to start me talking. I appreciate the fact that he genuinely wants to help veterans. I appreciate that. What I don't appreciate is that he is talking about veterans as if he understands the complexities of being a veteran. So I wrote a little editorial response to what I saw online and it became a thing. It was the front page of the New York Daily News and then it was an interview with Chris Cuomo and then I got invited to speak at other things and it became so busy that I decided I had to leave my job. So uh, about 13 months ago, I left my job because I have this fabulous husband who said, okay, if this is what you need to do to get the job done, then go ahead and do it. Um, and since then, I have been in Washington, D.C. 10 days out of every month. I have visited every single office of the House of Representatives. I am on the Veterans Advisory Board for my Congressman, Sean Patrick Maloney. I have worked with Senator Schumer and was his guest at the State of the Union this year. Um, and I am working really, really hard on a couple of things that I think will help to alleviate some of the compl complications of getting assistance from the VA when you are seriously struggling, especially with mental health issues. 
And, and that's, uh, that is definitely a lot, and, and even in a short time. But one of the things that I really appreciate, and, and as you and I have been uh, communicating for a little bit, um, is that when I was in the military, and I've said it before, is uh, we don't remember where we came, or we, don't, we shouldn't forget where we came from, meaning as a leader we should remember what it was like as a soldier. Uh, one thing that I admire about you is that it always it starts with in the middle of the conversation and ends with um, your experience as a mother and watching Daniel um, experience what he did. That's, that's your drive. That's your reason why. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's critical to be able to continue to give the, the ability to have this advocacy. Absolutely. And I find, you know, it's very helpful to me when I go to meetings on Capitol Hill, when I go to, you know, interviews, whatever activity I'm involved in, I bring pictures of Daniel, a picture from when he was two, a picture from when he was four, when he was 12, when he was dressed up for the prom, when he first became a soldier, and um, the last time he came to visit us for Christmas. And I share these pictures because the images that you see when you look at Daniel are of somebody glowing and happy, red hair and freckles with a bright smile. You can see the kindness radiating out of him. But in that last picture where he looks so darn happy, he is a raging addict with a massive case of PTSD. And if you didn't know, if I didn't tell you that, you would never expect that to be the case. Because people who don't understand, imagine the guy on the cardboard box drinking out of a paper bag. And that's not who he was. So people need to be educated on what a veteran who's struggling looks like and to understand that you don't know what's going on inside the head and heart of somebody else unless you ask them. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that's definitely what I'm trying to do here with the, uh, the book, blog, and podcast, changing the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health. As you were talking about Daniel's story earlier, I, I'm reminded of the fact that it, many times, especially with veterans, if we lose someone in combat, we get stuck on the ending, that, that freeze frame. And, and someone could do the same thing if they were to hear just the beginning of Daniel's story, just a, a five-second soundbite of, of uh, Stephanie Keegan's a mother who lost her son to, to complications from his addiction, people would automatically think, oh, he was just another drug-addicted veteran. Um, and, right. and they would not see the whole movie of his life, the whole story of, I, I, I served in 10th Special Forces Group. You don't get into those organizations, um, you know, just cause, right? I mean, especially right. to to be able to serve and, and serve as an intelligence analyst as he did. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was one of those things that that you had to be. So at one point he was capable. You don't get into the green to gold program um, if, if you're not a <laughs> capable soldier. And so right. all of these different things show the story of Daniel's life and the tragic ending. And it's not the end of his story because you're definitely carrying his story on. But people can focus on that end and lose sight of the entire life. And, and, that, right. and that in itself right. is a tragedy. Right. And, you know, when, when I go into more depth, and, and you can cut me off at any time, but when I go into more depth about Daniel, I mention the fact that this was a kid who had an 800 on the verbal on the SATs, a 760 on the math. He got a perfect score on the ASVAB, and he was a nationally ranked competitive fencer. This was somebody who built a library at the Kandahar Airfield with donations from Operation Paperback, so his soldiers would have a way to escape what they were living in the middle of. He started a fencing club on Kandahar Airfield so that if people didn't want to read, they could, they could exercise their way away from what they had just come back from or what they were about to go into. This was somebody who cared deeply about everyone around him and used every bit of heart and intelligence that he had to do his best to make the world better for everyone. And, you know, this is, you, you can't, encapsulate his whole life in five minutes but it is important to me at least that people understand that every single soldier who was lost every single veteran who was lost is is somebody's child is somebody's friend is somebody's sibling they have a story that that goes so far into the world that there are 
thousands and thousands of people who will never be the same. Either their lives will have been improved by this person being on the planet, or they will be spending the rest of their life in grief, mourning the loss of somebody who was doing nothing but good for the world. Right, and and, and that's very important is to Daniel was uh, all of those things. It's not that he was, um, you know, uh, an addict, if we want to use that that label, so to speak. Not that I'm too into labels, but not that he was just uh, anything. He wasn't just a a highly intelligent young man any more than he was just an addict. He was a collection of all of these things, just like we're a collection of all of the different things. Right. Um, And and a lot of people will automatically take a look at it. I I work with justice-involved veterans. Uh, in, mm-hmm. in my clinical work, uh, and they'll say, and, and the veterans themselves will label themselves, well, I'm just a criminal now, or I'm just to this, or I'm just to that. Right. And challenging these labels, um, but but society will, will also, or, or our communities, especially those communities who haven't been involved in service, uh, or, or don't have anything in service. And that that's what I see, uh, again, from afar in, in our conversations uh, briefly that we've had, is that's your advocacy work. It's not just keeping Daniel's um, story alive, but also using Daniel's story as uh, one story that's indicative of many different stories, and that you're trying to bridge the gap between those who have served and those who haven't. Exactly, exactly. And so it, some of that is, as you'd said, you'd, uh, you'd worked in the uh, political arena, and, and this is something that's obviously very necessary uh, for, for advocacy um, and, and I, as a clinical mental health counselor or, or anyone, to be able to make changes in the long term, it has to do with uh, policy and legislation. Now, a lot of your focus has been on um, opioid abuse and things like that, uh, definitely concerning mm-hmm. what Daniel's, um, uh, Daniel's situation was. Uh, what I see as a clinician, uh, the opioid epidemic which is raging across the U.S., but definitely in the veteran population uh, and the military family population. It starts on active duty. Um, it starts, mm-hmm. obviously, with, with the painkillers. We, we put too much wet, uh, weight in our rucks or jump out of 36 too many airplanes uh, yeah. and end up with, uh, with pain. So I, I'd like to hear a little bit about the work you're doing about opioid awareness and, and some of the advocacy work you've done in that area. Okay, so there are several wonderful organizations um, that do some really wonderful work. There's um, a retired Admiral, Admiral Winnefeld, and his wife, Mary, who lost a child who was a civilian. He was a student in college at the time, and they lost their son to addiction. So I've done some work with their organizations called the SAFE Project, and it is just outstanding. I've also worked on um, a variety of different efforts to try and help figure out the best way to make sure that um, somebody struggling with an addiction gets the kind of treatments that they need. So there's this justice court program, which I absolutely love. Um, I'm very friendly with somebody who's involved in it. And I have done some advocacy work for them because I kept hoping that Daniel would get into just the right amount of trouble so that he would be picked up and put into the justice court system where they would take care of him. The justice court system holds you responsible for your poor choices, but doesn't imprison you. It puts you into treatment. It makes you, you know, do your darndest to get clean. It holds you accountable for your actions. And once you have gone through the program, which is an extended period of time, you are then no longer under the the umbrella of fear that this, this problem that got you into the system in the first place is going to come back and haunt you. You have paid your debt by getting clean and becoming a functional member of society. So I kept hoping Daniel would get involved in that. Um, But he actually was um, very popular with the police in, in the Fayetteville area. He had campaigned hard for the sheriff of Cumberland County. And when Daniel was on, he was, he was a pleasure and a force to be reckoned with. And they loved him. So every time he'd get himself into a little trouble, they would just very gently escort him home and say, stay put. And, you know, they were, they were so visibly heartbroken by having to go into his home and find him the way they did, that 
you know, it it actually in a perhaps peculiar way really warmed my heart. But there are fabulous programs that are working in spe- in specific with the veteran population to help them get what they need to stop being broken, to repair some of the wounds so that they can function instead of just criminalizing their behavior and locking them up and throwing the way the uh, away the key. Now, I will definitely make sure that uh, that the links to Operation Saver are in the show notes, um, but definitely I, as a proponent of uh, of the veteran courts and, and the treatment courts. Uh, we actually had uh, uh, an episode on veteran courts back in episode 67 with Kevin Schneider. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, it is extremely critical. I have seen it change lives where a veteran will come in. The challenge is, is as you said, and it's almost heartbreaking that you say this, is I want him to get in just enough trouble um, to be able to to uh, uh, you know get into the justice system because that may be the only way that we get him help, um, right? And, and that's one of the challenges that I see that a veteran uh, before in, in here in El Paso County, many courts are co- considered post plea courts, so you have to plead guilty, you know, mm-hmm. to a to a criminal offense and you're on probation, um, but a, is the day before a veteran pleads guilty. They have no resources whatsoever. But the day after, then they have all the resources available. They have someone to help them navigate the VA. Um, in, in many jurisdictions across the U.S. like ours, um, they can connect them with a community provider. Um, as you said, in, in the way that Daniel got out, he was able to get an honorable discharge. Many veterans are not so lucky. Um, right. You know, in, in Daniel's situation specifically, it, it very easily could have been an other than honorable discharge, and it would have been even more of an uphill battle. Um, mm-hmm. And so as challenging as it was for Daniel, um, those veterans who have the most need, perhaps ones who, who got out with another than honorable discharge, have the least resources. And often it's only once they, you know, get involved in, in, in the law and, and end up in the back of a police car, only then are they able to get the services. Uh, and that's challenging as well. Right, right. And unfortunately, at this point, those services are not available throughout every criminal district in the country. It's it's kind of limited now. It's growing every day, but it is kind of limited now. And, you know, you have to be fortunate enough to deal with law enforcement officials who care more about the person that is inside that addict than they do about the stupid that that person did trying to get their hands on more drugs. And that's, that's another opportunity to teach, to teach law enforcement and to show them by the successes that a program like that really, really works and should be in place everywhere. Um, We can save people who can save others and who can be fabulous members of a community and continue to serve in a way that they feel makes that they feel validates who they are. Because once you leave the service, you're sort of kind of swimming around trying to figure out how you continue to find meaning in your everyday life. Um, yeah. Well, I, I really like in what you, you just said there, that this is a way to teach. I, I get the sense that's exactly what you do. I love military moms. I, of course, love my military mom. Um, <laughs> but but that the, the, there's a lesson that's that that you need to learn, lessons that moms want to teach their children, mothers want to teach their children. But but you're trying to instruct the nation. You're trying to teach right. the, the uh, and in your lane, uh, legislative advocacy, but just trying to, you're trying to impart a lesson on those um, who may not come in contact with veterans, who may not have awareness of veterans. Right, right. And that is because the percentage of the population that serves now is so small and is voluntary. It's not like when my brother's friends were in Vietnam and everybody sat in front of the television every night and tried to see faces they recognized on the coverage that was going on in the jungles of Vietnam. This is a very quiet war in this country. And it's very easy for people who have no military experience or military members in their family to sort of, you know, say there's other things that are more important. And don't get me wrong, there are other things that are as important as taking care of our veterans. But there's nothing that's 
more important than taking care of our veterans. And if people were able to personalize it so that they came to understand that this could well be the child of somebody they know. This could well be a family member somewhere down the road. If you were able to see that this was a glowing, beautiful child who went down a very dark path because of his service, maybe they would be more willing to stand up and say, we've got to do more. Uh, and, and I think uh, that that awareness is critical. Of course, I'm I'm curious to hear how your uh, your awareness, your your teaching moments, maybe how has that been received over the past couple years? Well, I have to say, and I don't mean to sound cross, it is very very difficult to turn away a woman who is standing in front of you with a picture of a kid who looks like Opie and says this is my dead veteran son and you need to help me make sure that you don't have another mother standing in front of you with another picture someday. So people are very receptive to chatting with me and it is very easy to pick up really quickly who's really paying attention and listening. I've had wonderful reception. Nobody has ever been in on Capitol Hill. Nobody has ever been rude to me. You know, Public formats can can get a little nasty sometimes, but I'm a big girl. I can handle it. But on Capitol Hill, in my travels across New York State and everywhere else that I've been talking about veterans, talking about mental health, talking about addiction, people have been exceptionally receptive and, and respectful of what happened with Daniel and how I envision moving the conversation forward so that it stops happening with other people. Mothers, children. No, it's uh, definitely can be a very compelling um, uh, argument. Uh, and, and again, when when it when it is in your face, I mean, a lot of people, it is at an arm's distance. It's something that mm-hmm. uh, you know someone is over there, but it is very important to be able to um, to be able to say, no, this is a real thing that's happening to real people, um, and and this was a very real young man. Um, who, like you said, was impacted by his military service. Um, you know, he didn't grow up in, a, uh, in an adverse uh, condition, and, and it wasn't childhood trauma. Um, this is someone who served and was impacted by his service. And even in spite of how it ended, uh, his service was not dishonorable. Um, and right. so I can see where that's a, a very compelling uh, argument. So On both sides of the aisle, I have to say, I have been equally received on both sides of the aisle. So this is a very easy, nonpartisan conversation, easy in that it, it's something that people do listen to, and it doesn't matter, you know, who they're representing, they do listen. And I, I am enormously grateful. I've gotten as much support on both sides of the aisle as I could hope for, and I'm going to continue badgering people till I get even more. And I think that's critical, too. I mean, obviously, and even as as you and I were discussing before we we started recording for the show, is that uh, not that many things are bipartisan these days. Um, You know, this um, and and a lot of people, again, it's it's gone on so long that that it's almost a, a a reminder. Oh, by the way, we're still in Afghanistan. For those who had never served, obviously for me and my family and for you and, and those of us who have connection, it's very real and accurate. Um, but for others who don't have a connection, it's just a, you know, oh, by the way, football season starting, I just realized that, right? I mean, it's right. just this one thing that, that, that pops in and out. But for others, it's it's our lives. And, and one of the things that, that I always, again, and even what I'm trying to do here is to bridge the gap between those who have served and those who haven't served, helping those who mm-hmm. served, like Daniel, say, look, there is a place for you to go. There are mental health professionals who can support you and, and, and can do that. Uh, you've had some success with with that gap building, uh, specifically with legislation in this past year um, through the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, you were able to get two bills in um, or two sections or two amendments to the bill um, that specifically speak to bridging this gap. Yes, and I am, you know, I can't tell you how fortunate I feel that I have 
garnered such strong support so quickly. It might be just because I'm a pain in the ass, but who knows? Um, the fact is that two things are in the NDAA that is going to be signed by the president um, at Fort Drum in New York, apparently, um, that uh, will will go a ways to helping our veterans. The first one is the Know Your Vets Act, which was written um, by my congressman, Sean Patrick Maloney. And this bill, what it does is there's a form for people who are listening who don't know this, and there's probably not many. There's the DD-214, right, which is a form you fill out when you're exiting the service. And on that form, there are lots of opportunities to check off for things that might happen moving forward. One of those is to notify the location, the area of the country where you are planning to relocate to after your service. Um, so that they are aware of, you know, they can sort of keep account of veterans and who's coming into the area. But they were never, those state and local officials who were aware, were never able to share the information about an incoming veteran with any of the veteran service organizations. There was concern about um, privacy violations, and it was it was never something that, a, a solution was found for until this year, where Sean wrote this bill that says, on the DD-214, there will now be a box that you can check that says, yes, it is okay to, look, to share my information with the veteran service organizations in the area to which I am relocating. This allows those VSOs who have been shaking their heads trying to figure out how to find the veterans, it allows them to have the information so that they can reach out to a veteran after that veteran comes to their area and, and give them the information about how they can help them access resources in the area. It's so simple. It's absolutely brilliant. And it will go a long way to allowing veterans who have families to feed and houses to find and home roofs to put over their heads and jobs to civilian jobs to find to, to take away the, oh, what am I going to do for myself piece of it? Because they've already taken it away. They've got too many other things to think about. This way, they will be contacted, and at the convenience of that veteran, they will then be able to reach out to these resources that they have been connected with. It's positively brilliant, and I am so impressed with Congressman Maloney for the work he did for that. No, I, um, the I, other thing. Well, and, and so just to touch on that one, I, I also think that it is – um, it is so staggering simple that it is brilliant. Um, <laughs> when, whenever I transitioned out, of course, that was one thing. My father was a veteran, so he said, your DD-214, it's uh, more precious than Willy Wonka's golden ticket, right? And this is <laughs> yeah. what, we, what we hold on to. And, and, and literally, to be honest, we lost my father last year to natural causes. Um, and one of the first things that, that he always made sure was where his DD-214 was. Um, right. and, and so it is critical. But one of the things that, that we're giving as we leave the service, we're given an option to do is file our DD-214 at our uh, local county court. Um, so I believe I have mine filed at my home of record in St. Louis, and I have it filed here. In the event that I you know, somehow misplaced the 75 copies that I've made uh, <laughs> of my DD-214, that, that it's in the county records. Um, right. But I, I never considered the idea of being able to release that to the El Paso County Veteran Service Office here. And there's there's county and state veteran service officers. Um, I, I believe in the bill it is talking specifically to veteran service officers. It's not like you're you're giving uh, permission to the Wounded Warrior Project or in, or right. or any of these organizations. This is this is uh, actual um, state level and county level employees um, exactly. that are then able to. Rather than waiting for the veteran to, you know, sitting back and waiting for the veteran to come to the buffet, you're able to actually outreach and say, hey, veteran, here's all the food and the different flavors and everything we have to feed you. Um, this is the support that we can provide. And I, I think that's a that is a great bill. And I'll, I'll look forward to, to seeing how that's implemented. Yeah, I'm very, very proud of the congressman for that one. And, you know, I was more than happy to stand up with him and talk about this because I think it's it's brilliant. And like you say, simple. And that's the thing. I think the simpler you get, the more you f refine your point to 
one specific thing, the easier it is to get it done. It doesn't cost a ton of money to make that information available to the veteran service organizations, the local and state organizations that can help and reach out to a veteran. The other thing that I'm doing is something on the warm handoff. It's called a warm handoff for transitioning service members suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. So this came about because I was just absolutely gobsmacked by the fact that Daniel left the Army under rather extraordinary circumstances. He had gotten himself into some trouble. They were trying to dishonorably discharge him after eight years of remarkable service. And he got a JAG attorney, and he fought back. And for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on, that JAG attorney called him one day and said, not only are you going to get your honorable, but you can also stay if you want to. And Daniel said, no, thank you, I'm leaving. But he didn't even have the normal TAP program, the exiting program for military service members that most people would, would undergo because it was a, an extraordinary circumstance. So when he left, they gave him a manila envelope with all of his paperwork they licked that envelope, sealed it shut, and when my husband went down to his home in North Carolina to pick up some of his things after Daniel died, there was the envelope still sealed. He had never even opened it. So this bill, what it does is it will um, – it, it, technically it requires the, the secretary of – the VA and the Secretary of the Department of Defense to sit down and by the 1st of December have a written set of instructions for um, commanders to have their exiting service members with an existing diagnosis and an honorable and therefore eligible for services discharge to be escorted to their local VA on the day of discharge so that they can be evaluated and the process can be started more efficiently. Um, I'm pretty sure that on the day of discharge, if Daniel had been evaluated, they wouldn't have released him from the hospital. He was a hot mess. And, you know, some of that was, I mean, people can say some of that was his fault. He made really stupid choices. We all know he made really stu stupid choices, and I make no secret about that. But he made really stupid choices because he was really, really sick and didn't know how to make really smart choices. So this will bridge that gap and start the process for evaluation much more quickly than would normally be the case. This one was written up by um, Elizabeth Warren and her staff, and I couldn't be more proud. I like, I'm really proud of that one. So there you go. Yeah, and I, and I think, and on that one, again, specifically, it is a different type of warm handoff. It's not just the, the handoff, um, uh, that, uh, here's the information coming from the, the provider side, um, but it's also for those veterans, uh, service members transitioning to veterans who may be especially vulnerable. I see this um, definitely as a um, a resource um, that will the the various warrior transition battalions uh, or the warrior transition units or organizations definitely like Walter Reed or or Brook Army Medical Center um, that uh, that that they have veterans that that would meet this criteria. Um, right. to be able to make that happen. This is one thing that I've, I've often said is that there's a gap between when a veteran um, engages, uh, when they leave the military, and when they engage in the VA. For me, it, it was, I think, honestly, a, a seven-month gap for some things, and it was actually a, probably a 14-month gap for others. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I had a, a, a very good transition and, and had you know, some stability in my life, and I was already working. Um, but for some veterans, it can take years or literally decades for, for some of our Vietnam veterans. And that's the same right. thing that we're going to see um, with a 65-year-old a Afghan vet, um, you know, in 40 years. Um, that, right. that there's going to be gaps, a gap of time, whether it's days, weeks, months, years, or decades, there's going to be a gap in time. What I, what I try to do as a community provider is to be able to provide some of that bridge to that gap um, that ultimately the VA is the long-term benefit 
for, for all the veterans. I, I often say I can provide outpatient counseling, but I wasn't going to be able to get Daniel into the VA's dual diagnosis program. I wasn't right. going to be able to get a, a veteran where we're at here in, in Sheridan, um, uh, Wyoming or Grand Junction, Nebraska, or uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, um, some excellent, and, and I've seen life-changing programs for the VA. The VA has some very, very good programs once you can get them started, once you can get right. the, it's sort of like the, the diesel engine. I, I see this as a way of the collaboration where community providers, which are much more capable and responsive, um, are able to, um, to, to get someone quickly and get them into services quickly with the ultimate long-term goal of transitioning ultimately to the Department of Veterans Affairs where you can definitely get the service in the long term. Uh, and I right. see this is a way for that especially vulnerable population um, to, to really, you know, it, it's, it's almost for the veterans who don't have the capability of making that connection themselves, it takes the responsibility of that connection out of their hands and it gets them the help they need. That's another exactly. uh, great Yes. Exactly. And, you know, because we are in a, a long lineage of military family, we I had no idea what might or might not be available, who to pick up the phone and call and say, my son is in, in trouble. Can you help him? I didn't even know I could do that. So and I tried very hard to get him to go to a c civilian provider while he waited. Daniel dug his heels in like he was wont to do on occasion. And he said, no. I'm owed this by the by the government. I'm going to go to the VA where they get it, and and you know he was living in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I'm sure there were several I know, providers. I know in five. Fayetteville. I know right. five off the top. Oh, oh, two of them right. are, are former special forces. Uh, you know, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure there were civilian providers. You couldn't have dragged him in, tied up, because there was no way he was going to anybody that wasn't VA. It was a foolish decision. It was also the decision made by somebody who was struggling with mental illness and feeling very abandoned and disrespected on a number of different fronts. And so that's the way he did it. And it was his determination that when he got well, he was going to help the VA. But I really believe that there is so much value in a partnership between civilian providers and VA. What it will do is it will free up some of the, the, the strains and stresses on the VA to be able to more effectively get people like Daniel who really need to be in a, in a military-based inpatient program into those programs because the weight of some of what they're trying to carry will be taken by civilian providers who absolutely get it, you know, and that's the key. They have to get it because a mental health practitioner for a civilian is very different than a mental health pr practitioner for a veteran. Um, and he was terrified that he was going to run into people who just didn't get it. So he didn't right. even try. And that's where a lot of the, um, again, what I'm trying to do is, is to, to one, help the veterans know that there are providers out there that do understand um, that can help bridge that gap and then ultimately uh, transition to the VA. Uh, yep, this... and you're doing great work. I have to tell you, I am a rabid fan of yours. You're doing great work. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And, and a lot of it is, is because of, uh, of people like you and, and others that, that recognize that we do need to change the way that we talk and think about um, mental health in general, but especially veteran mental health. As you said, right. um, it's, it, it is different. It is more complex. You know, I often say that, uh, um, you know, orthopedics in, in the military, out of the military, a knee is a knee and, a, and an ankle is an ankle. Um, but but mil, military mental health is not the same. It's a different set of experiences, um, a different set of, of, uh, of, of challenges, perhaps, or problems. Um, that, that veterans carry with them. And so uh, I definitely appreciate your advocacy and support, um, and definitely not just for me, but for Daniel's story and for, mm -hmm. for all of the veterans, and, and even going back to what you said, uh, so that there's not another mother holding the picture of her son telling a similar story. And that's, right. that's powerful. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I have met such wonderful people in this work and so many um, stories are being shared with me that are so similar to Daniel's, but end or continue on with more hope than Daniel had 
it is the most wonderful effort I have ever been involved in, and I will do it till I drop. Well, I, I can tell there doesn't seem to be any signs of slowing down. So if somebody <laughs> wanted to join you or to reach out and contact you or, or get more information, uh, how can they get in contact with you? Okay, well, um, via Twitter, my Twitter handle is War is Not Over. Um, and I'm on, I'm active on Facebook. You can find me. My name is Stephanie Keegan. Um, it, it's not difficult to find me. If you Google me, you'll get links to me very easily, but I am obnoxiously active on Twitter these days. So if you really want to find me fast, that's probably the best way to go. I will definitely make sure that, uh, all of that is, uh, included in the show notes and, uh, and, and we'll make sure that people can connect if you want to. I really appreciate you. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Stephanie. It was really a great conversation. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're listening to Headspace and Timing on the Change Your POV Podcast Network. Stephanie and I have been talking for quite a while, and I felt that it was important to get her story and Daniel's story out into the wider discussion around military transition veteran mental health. As tragic as it is, and it's very tragic, an even greater tragedy is that this is an all-too-common story that's impacting our nation. I've said it before, and I've said it often, this generation of veterans has the potential to have the same impact on this century that the post-World War II generation had on the last century. There are over 4 million combat veterans from the global war on terror. That's only a fraction of the combat veterans from World War II, but Stephanie shows that we have the ability to leverage our voice to be amplified by technology. Her actions and advocacy show that it's not only possible, it's extremely necessary. Veterans can and should get involved in advocating for veterans in many different capacities. One of the points that she makes is that sometimes it's even more effective when simple changes are made. Simple changes like allowing a veteran to choose to have their DD-214 sent to the local veteran service officer so that someone can reach out to them rather than waiting for the veteran to reach out. Or mandating that for those veterans who have a diagnosed condition, a connection be immediately made between the DOD and the VA. And not just a, here's where you go, good luck. When I was a platoon sergeant, I would often tell my soldiers to go somewhere on post, building 2587, for example. But without specific instructions and follow-up to make sure it happened, I often just had guys and gals wandering around the post confused. Stephanie's advocacy for veterans is an amazing example, just like Daniel's story is a cautionary tale. Not just for how it ended, but for the potential judgmentalness that occurs. Hearing it in its short form, one could say it's just another drug addict or just another screwed up soldier. But that would be doing Daniel an injustice, insulting the memory and the manner of his service. We can and should be doing better. It's possible. It just takes action. So I've been receiving a lot of great feedback about the latest Headspace and Tommy book, Combat Vet Don't Mean Crazy. I wanted to give a public thanks of appreciation for a reader who left a review on Amazon, Sarah the Medic. Sarah says, I'm only halfway through this book. This is because it is nutrient dense, so full of good stuff that I had to stop and chew over what I've read after every couple of chapters. Full disclosure, I'm not a vet, but one of the step sibling professions with related, similar, but different PTSD. A veteran first responder, former firefighter medic with a nearly two decade complex PTSD history. This book has helped me understand myself as well as my friends and colleagues who are vets. Now, that's some great feedback. Not just for me, but for anyone who could benefit from the book. If you want to get a copy, go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash combat vet book and pick one up for yourself. I've also been telling you about some of the things we're doing to spread the word about veteran mental health and wellness, and we're trying to get this information to you as many ways as we can. We started to develop content for your Echo device, and we've got some good stuff and more on the way. To see them all and more to come, check out veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash skills. So I have a treat for you next week, or maybe not. I'll leave it up to you to decide. A few months ago, I participated in the StoryCorps Military Voices Initiative, which provides a platform for service members, veterans, and military families to share their stories. I recorded a conversation between me and a local friend here in Colorado, Jennifer Birch, in which Jen asked me a series of questions about my military service. Rather than me interviewing someone about their work with veterans, the tables are turned, and I'm the one answering the questions. Maybe it'll give you an insight into me if you haven't gotten one by now already. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. And until then, stay focused and be well. I'd like to thank the Change Your POV Podcast Network for hosting this show and highlighting the critical importance of veteran mental health. We want to hear from you. You can reach out to me via email at duane at veteranmentalhealth.com. 
You can find me at Twitter at The Counseling Vet or head on over to Facebook and look for the Change Your POV Squad. You can find the show notes for this episode and all the episodes by going to VeteranMentalHealth.com or ChangeYourPOV.com. Sign up for updates on either or both so you don't miss another episode. While you're at it, check out the other great shows on the Change Your POV podcast network. The show about remembering our military history and reviving our warrior spirit, changing hearts and minds. The show about outdoor activities that us veterans love so much, Neophyte in the Woods. The show that helps us get going at the beginning of the week, Motivation Monday. And Attack Fridays, the show that brings you actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge to help you make the best of your transition. While you're checking out the other shows, drop us a review in iTunes or whatever podcast platform you're listening to. The reviews really help spread the word about what we're doing. If you're looking for the total package for all the information you need to live the life you want after leaving the military, you found it. If you know of a buddy who's looking for the same info, share it with them so they can find it too. I want to thank Doc Todd for his permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his amazing album, Combat Medicine. Doc Todd is somebody who's trying to bring veteran mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you can get the album by going to therealdoctod.com. Check it out, because remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real, found a feast and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-creating enemies Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic Tennessee, embrace my ability